so I'll just share this as a uh, presentation I gave to our department heads and our senior leadership here at the county, um, just to kind of talk about the platform and how we've used it since we purchased it about a year and a half ago. Um, and similarly, actually to Mo, the real catalyst for us choosing public input was the pandemic and the amount of communication we had to do um, during the pandemic uh, and how much we had to pivot so quickly to everything being virtual and how our community responded to that actually and learned a lot of new skills uh, and now has an expectation that um, things should be more accessible and things should be available online and things should have digital tools. Um, so that landscape has changed significantly and this is kind of the response to that. So this is our homepage. Um, these are our project goals. I'm not going to go through every one of them. I really encapsulate our project goals with two uh, big buckets, and I call that um, equity of access and increasing transparency. Each of these really falls into one of those two. Um, we saw in the pandemic that people were working all kinds of crazy schedules. Uh, people were working two jobs if they were getting their kids through school during the day and working from home. So those traditional working hours just went right out the window. Um, so increasing equity of access is something that public input allows us to do. People can um, engage at three in the morning if that's when they are available or it so suits them. Um, and increasing access, we are a large county geographically, and we're really geographically diverse. So people know us as, you know, the county Asheville is in, but the four corners of our county stretch mountains, uh, really high elevation roads that sometimes take two and a half hours to cross from corner to corner of our county. So um, reaching our whole population can be tricky. Uh, and this is all about um, increasing that access for all of our residents. Um, and also just increasing transparency, our boards and commissions, um, new projects, all of that sometimes doesn't have a place to live. And I'll explain that. So public input can be used for all of these things. You might already know that if you've been talking to Mo, um, but I summarize it into three big buckets. For us, it is to live stream record and be a landing page for our boards and commissions. It is a nursery for early stage projects. And it is also um, a page where we do our surveys and community feedback and outreach. So those three buckets are really um, the three I focus on the most. We've had in the last year and a half, we've been using the program. Uh, here are some of our stats. People are always shocked that we've had over 3,000 meeting attendees. And they're like, really? People are watching our meetings? Yes, they watch them at three in the morning if that's what works for them. Um, and uh, 102,000 site visitors. I am obsessed with having our email subscribers. So I love having over a thousand email contacts for people who are subscribing to the uh, niche interests they have and we're able to really contact them directly. And I even have a couple examples from today. Um, so here's where I like to talk about kind of some limitations on our end that should color the rest of the presentation which is that our county website is hand coded. It is built by hand by two people in our web department. Um, so during the pandemic, having to update and be nimble and flexible with changing meeting sites, changing meeting um, technologies, and even uh, just hearing from the public, it was really hard to be responsive to that. And that's part of um, why we went with public input. So knowing that we treat public input like a sister site to our county site um, is really important to know as we go through the rest of the presentation. Um, it's not replacing our county site, it's just to support because it can do things our county site can't do. Right, so I'll start with boards and commissions. Um, and this has been kind of my main uh, task since I've started is getting all of our boards and commissions moved over to public input. And you can see a list of them here and building them pages um, to keep their materials, their agendas, their meetings all organized, get them live streamed and increase again that access and transparency. So all of our boards kind of start with a standard 
uh, meetings, members, and documents, like you'll see here with our Justice Resource Advisory Council. And we always build them a subscribe button. And then um, our videos are housed right there. All the meetings and our files are right here. All the presentations live with the meetings. Um, JRAC is interesting. And here's where I like to highlight what public input can do. Because it's very flexible, JRAC has a lot of data dashboards and transparency dashboards that link directly to our detention center um, transparency page and things like that. So I'm, I'm able to do things for JRAC uh, and link things there that um, not every board is gonna have, right? So JRAC's board looks a little different than the Ag Advisory Board or Early Childhood Committee Board. And um, I'm able to kind of customize that. A few of our boards do um, yearly grants. So I'm able to have tabs for grants, awards, applications, links to resources and videos. Um, and so it's a, just a great way to support our boards and be really flexible. Again, because our boards were having to put in IT tickets every time they wanted just like an agenda uploaded to the website. Um, so being able to do that really quickly on public input has made a big difference. And we make sure to link our sister sites. So this is our some screenshots of our county site. And every board has, uh, I call it the engage button now, that links to all those materials. They're still showing their calendar invites. They're still showing information about their board on the county site. But the full story, more details, if you're really into this board, here's the button. And we make sure to also link um, in each of those calendar events to, to our sister site. Um, and that has been really successful. And we've had, a, a, we've trained a lot of our residents now to know to go to engage um, for those materials. I always stop here um, because if you end up using public input, you will be surprised at the questions you get about live streaming and recording. Even though we all went through um, the pandemic and had to use Zoom or Teams or Google Meet, I still get a lot of questions about live streaming and a lot of fears. People lock up and get a little bit um, intimidated by the idea of live streaming. So I always say a live stream is a one way out. That doesn't mean that our viewers are in the meeting. Uh, one of the questions I get from boards as they go and try to talk to them is like, well, are people just going to unmute and start talking in the meeting? And it's like, no, we're live streaming out to other platforms like YouTube and Facebook Live. They are not in the meeting. Um, so that has been a good question and it's something to just remember. Um, and we've actually had a lot of response. Um, for a while there during COVID, we had Sunshine Request um, organization coming into our meetings, filming things on cell phones, uh, filming meetings on cell phones. And uh, it just wasn't a great look to have another group come in and film our meetings for us. So public input allows us to live stream and record those meetings. Um, and Sunshine Request has started sharing our Facebook posts about it. So um, kind of solved that problem too. Any questions about boards and commissions or anything we've talked about so far? Okay, I'll go on to that second big bucket. So the first was boards and commissions. The second one is surveys and feedback. So we uh, run a lot of surveys and feedback. Our commissioners love to see data to support decisions um, and often we'll send projects back if there's not enough community engagement to prove that a project is a need or that it would be valuable to the community. So our surveys and feedback are really important to a lot of our different departments. And we partner with a lot of our different departments um, to do surveys that make sense for public input. Um, I love that it automatically collects the IP address. It's a one way for us to see what communities we might be missing out on. And we can compare those incoming results with the equity mapping. Cool. So here are the two surveys. Um, here are two surveys we've recently put out. And I like to stop here and just say, um, you'll always see with our surveys part of um, the introduction before we ask people to take our survey is explaining how we will use their data and their input. 
So especially with this downtown employee parking program, um, this is a great example of how we asked the community for feedback and went back to them and proved that their feedback made a difference. So we have two county owned parking lots. Uh, you can imagine in Asheville that our service industry workers have a really hard time finding parking during our busy tourism season and it's very expensive. Um, so we were able to open up about 200 parking spots in our county owned decks for industry workers and hotels and restaurants. So we partnered, we went out, we got their feedback and we said, your feedback is going to be taken to commissioners to justify this program. Uh, when it was indeed passed by the commissioners because we got over 800 responses, um, we were able to use that email campaigns feature, go back to those employees that took their time to take our survey and say, hey, look, you created this program, click here to apply. Um, and that was really powerful. Uh, but again, we want to always share how we plan to use their data, what decisions it could end up impacting, and um, make sure to go back and inform the, the public, keep that feedback loop going so they understand that their time was valuable and it didn't just go into somebody's inbox and die there. Um, Mo asked me a question about like, well, how do you use real feedback if it's negative and maybe um, isn't going the way uh, maybe you thought it would. So right now we have an open survey. Our board of commissioners are considering changing their meeting schedule and um, they were ready to vote on it. They were ready to vote and they said, hey, wait, like let's check with the community and make sure. Well, the surveys we're getting back now are, are really against it. They're hearing a lot about you know, traditional working schedules. And um, I think that ultimately, that information is going to go straight to commissioners and maybe change some minds on that vote. Um, and that will be really interesting to go back to the public and say, hey, we heard you. We heard you and this change won't go through. I don't know. I could be wrong. Um, but it's just powerful. And the more times we can build trust with our community that says, hey, you took the survey and then it did something. Um, is really powerful. We, I think, all have some jaded community members who believe that um, some of these surveys are just like a checkbox to say that we got community feedback, but really they're going to do whatever they want. Uh, that is not how it works here because we have this powerful tool. Um, I love to use offline engagement. Our public engagement team goes out into the community for all kinds of events where the community is already gathering and they bring relevant surveys or they bring um, relevant projects out with kiosk mode. You can see here with the iPad setup or paper surveys, even QR codes, whatever works for our community. Um, because we're a mountain community, sometimes we do not have internet access at some of the places where we gather. And so we've got to come prepared with that paper survey. We've got to come prepared with um, a different way to get community feedback and to vary that. Um, so kiosk mode and the paper surveys have been really useful. And equity mapping. So I explain this to our department heads as blind spot detection. A lot of times we can get survey results back and say like, yeah, this is what I thought. This is what I predicted um, our community would say when really our internal biases and our own preferences might be showing up and what we expected. The equity mapping tool helps us see where we might not have gotten community responses and where we might be missing um, key parts of our community. So um, I like to say that we look at equity mapping a few times during any campaign and ask ourselves whose voices are missing or underrepresented. How can we pivot our community strategy to reach out to these voices? And how can we make sure the data is really telling the whole story and not just a story that's convenient? I saw somebody put it in the chat. So how do we reach community members in rural areas identified from zip code and equity mapping? How do you gather those key parts? That is where we really partner with our public engagement team. Um, we can also, depending on the department it's with, we can do some outreach um, with them specifically. So, for instance, the um, survey we had up recently for the Waste Pro contract, our um, trash services contract, 
uh, we were able to put QR codes to the survey in everyone's billing envelope. Um, that was really helpful to reach our rural communities that um, aren't necessarily uh, engaging in all of our social media. Um, and then our public engagement team does some amazing outreach at community events on a weekly basis. We have community markets, um, and they're making sure to bring palm cards out and paper surveys and kiosks um, to make sure we're reaching any of those blind spots we're detecting as we go. I hope that that kind of answer your question, Brenda. That's one of our mechanisms, I'd say. Um, something to note about this is when I came on board, we were doing our comprehensive plan and um, they were already in phase three, I believe. And I noticed when I ran the equity mapping report, like 90% of our responses were coming from a one square block in Asheville. And I was so confused. I was like, we are really missing this whole swath of the community. Well, early on in using the platform, they didn't gather zip codes when they did paper surveys. And then they brought those paper surveys back and staff members entered them into public input. So it looked like all of those surveys were taken in downtown because that's where our office was. So that was definitely something um, asking that zip code question is really key if people aren't taking them at home on their own IP address. Little helpful hint. Yeah, I'm a, I'll add a little context there too. I think that's great. And I really do appreciate you pointing that out because that, that kind of highlights where technology and people meet, right? Like where, how do we work together? How does technology help, right? Um, while you do have that online interaction is capturing the GOIP locations and helping you try to figure out where you're hearing from, when those offline interactions happen, it is crucial for, for your team to consider what type of uh, information can we gather, maybe without being too, uh, too personal, right? Maybe asking for the nearest cross streets or zip codes getting some type of uh, identification um, to be able to say, okay, we're hearing from this general region or from this area. And I think Angelica made a great point saying like when they first started, all that data that came in from downtown Asheville, and it looked like they were capturing a lot of information there, but um, it was all manual and entered from their team their, themselves rather than representing the folks that actually took the surveys. Yeah, so that was definitely, um something we learned and, and improved on. Um, with the surveys, this is probably my favorite thing to do uh, is look at comment tags and sentiments and build my own comment tags. Um, of course, the system runs like keywords, right? It's gonna run like you see here with the red and the green. That's just running keywords that re were repeated in comments. Um, and the red is flagging like a sentiment, like. Overall, people were not in favor of fines for this one survey we put out. Um, that is great at a glance. It really helps me distill that down when I'm sharing that with um, departments we're working with. But I also have the ability to tag comments myself using my common sense and using the, uh, the real understanding or the real meat of the um, comment. The perfect example of this is in our opioid settlement funds um, survey. I know a lot of us, if you're in North Carolina, we've got these massive opioid settlements. We've got to do some public engagement around that and hear what the public wants us to do in terms of those 12 strategies. So one of the comments we got repeatedly had the keyword Narcan in it. And again and again, we saw Narcan come up. But if I hadn't had the ability to tag those comments myself, I might have said, oh, you know, 98 people are saying Narcan is a good strategy. Well, actually, when you dug into it, it kind of revealed a misconception in a huge amount of our population. Um, and so I was able to actually tag what they were saying about Narcan. Some people were saying Narcan is a great tool. We need to invest more in this. And some of our community members really believe that Narcan is enabling people and um, we should just never distribute Narcan. Uh, so that is actually seeing those comments and having the ability to distill comments and make qualitative data quantitative was um, a great thing for us because now as our strategy rolls out, because Narcan is um, 
Narcan distribution is going to end up being what we fund in the next fiscal year as one of our main strategies to combat the opioid crisis here in Buncombe County. We're able to now craft a communications campaign that includes real people who have been saved by Narcan and who have gone back to serve the community and serve those with substance abuse disorder. Um, and one of those people we're going to interview for one of these education campaigns says, hey, you can't um, get sober if you're dead, right? Like you can't recover if you're dead. Narcan kept me alive and gave me a second chance. And that is um, an insight I don't think we would have gotten from the comments if we weren't able to tag them using common sense. We weren't able uh, to distill out that misconception. There were a couple other misconceptions, but that kind of tends to come up in a lot of our comment tags. We get the real sentiment behind them. And I really appreciate that. Uh, and not jumping to improper conclusions just because I'm seeing a word repeating. So um, Brenda had asked about participant outreach and just a couple other things that we do. Uh, that downtown employee parking program we talked about, we have a couple partners in our economic development department, um, the Asheville Association of um, Hotel and Restaurateurs. We specifically sent out the link to that survey directly to our hotel and restaurant partners so they could get it to their employees. We wanted to make sure that the survey for downtown employees was getting to downtown employees. So we leveraged those relationships to make sure that would happen and make sure we weren't getting a lot of oddball responses from people who really weren't um, the key group, the key target group for this survey. And then we also have um, developed palm cards specifically in different languages and distributed those again, community partners, some of our nonprofits we work with, making sure they can help us get um, responses on the front lines. Uh, the opioid settlement funds is a great example of where we went out to treatment centers, we went out to our peer specialists, and we made sure they were the ones taking the surveys um, for the things that mattered. We use Nextdoor, our social media, of course we use our public engagement team, community groups, business partners, um, and our social media uh, and articles. But there's a lot of different ways you can generate participant outreach in a really targeted way using the tools of public media. Um, something I talked to Mo about that I um, developed to work with boards, commissions, and especially surveys is a scope of project form to understand exactly what people are wanting to get out of the survey and kind of asking that first question first, which is how do you intend to use this data? Um, it's kind of one of the ways I protect the platform and that I wanna understand how these um, data points are gonna be used to influence decisions. And if they're not, then maybe we shouldn't be using public input. Maybe this is not the right platform for this survey. Um, but I want to understand your priority and goals. I want to understand the mechanisms. Um, for instance, that waste pro survey going out in the bill. Great idea. That's a great mechanism to get that survey out because we know it's going to waste pro subscribers. Um, I ask about survey questions in the scope of project forms. Sometimes I'll have a group come to me and they already have their 10 questions. And they're like, we just want you to build us a survey. Well, some of those could be combined, right? Or maybe the way this is being asked is confusing or public input has a different format of question that would be easier, or this survey is too dang long and people are gonna bail on it. And that's a conversation I end up having to have sometimes with people just with my professional judgment, what we've seen in doing so many of these surveys now. Um, and it's helpful to kind of set those expectations early so people know um, what I'm going to ultimately build for them and what they can expect in terms of the plan and how the communications department will get that survey out. Uh, and it helps me be able to tell departments the assets I need from them. Sometimes I need pictures, sometimes I need a video. I might need an infographic that explains a really tricky topic. Um, but he, that scope of project form kind of sets the tone for that so I don't start building in the wrong direction. And the last big bucket. Sorry, I just wanted to go, if you go back to the last page, just wanted to highlight mm -hmm. something. We had um, that, this question came from one of um, the people that I'm speaking with a PIO down in uh, Florida. Doesn't look like she was able to join back. She was here earlier. But 
um i think this this is good this highlights a, a little bit more of like um what what technology looks like when an agency or a single department purchase or owns owns the license right oftentimes you'll have naysayers from other departments that don't want to put up budget or don't want to um uh support getting technology when maybe from your team or communications you know like hey we need something to be able to centralize all this um having some type of scope of um like some standard procedure or even what she uh, what angelica put over here scope of project form right putting something together on paper um as you start doing your outreach and you start um seeing all these quantifiable metrics that you're bringing in and seeing all this analytics other departments might might want to tap in or council or commissioners might be like, hey, tap into the department's work. They're doing great work. Um, when you start getting these projects handed to you or requests coming in, having some type of format to say like, hey, our best practice is this. Um, let's follow these guidelines. And I think this kind of highlights uh, this highlights that. I hope I didn't speak out of uh, term here, Angelica. Not at all. Thanks for summarizing that. And something I didn't say here that I would love to hit on just um, especially something our department is working on. Um, we're working on a language access policy. We have a bilingual communication specialist. It is really important to us, the language translation features that public input has, but it also means that as we're working with departments, especially on um, some more dense topics, like the comprehensive plan is a super dense topic. It has a lot of planning heavy language, a lot of jargon, um, it is important for us to prioritize plain language, not only because of our, our resident populations and wanting people to not bail on surveys because it's like doing homework, um, but also because plain language translates better. Uh, we want to make sure that we're increasing that equi equity of access. Um, so that's something when we start the scope of project form, I can start having those conversations with people early. Like, what is that? Um, acronym you said, what does that really mean? Um, talk me through that. Don't write me a paragraph, talk me through how you would explain that to your grandmother, right? Prioritizing that plain language early in the process um, is really helpful for people to understand where we're headed. So the last big bucket we use public input for is early stage projects and initiatives. I call it kind of our nursery. So these are for projects that are brand new, are still in very big public input and public engagement seasons. They're changing rapidly and they um, don't necessarily need a full website built yet because things need to be nimble and flexible. As new information comes in, oftentimes our early stage projects we're working with consultants and we that information changes all the time. We have new presentations. We have four upcoming community meetings. So that information needs to be nimble. And again, remember our website is hand coded. It just is would not even be feasible to live on our county website. Um, and we have this concept of the landing page. We want to make sure all of our articles, all of our social media all of our press releases go to some sort of landing page where people can get more information about a project, where they can subscribe to a project and get updates as they go. Um, we have a lot of bond projects, greenway projects that are multi-year projects. Um, people are going to get updates on a slow basis, but if they are subscribed, they're going to hear the updates first. Um, but I, I love that it kind of bakes engagement in very early on. Our affordable housing page um, got us a ton of community questions before we even went out for our first community meeting. So we were able to kind of bake some answers into the presentation and into our materials and into our um, articles touting these events ahead of time because we opened up those question and comment windows early on the landing pages. Um, and kind of set ourselves up to answer the questions people had. Um, and we wouldn't have been able to do that with our website. Uh, we try to gather uh, demographic information with all of our surveys. This is a little out of order. This should, should have been with surveys. Um, but we are really, really close to having our demographics on public input match the demographics of Buncombe County. What?
and here are age demographics too. So Wanda, so, you have a question? Sorry. Oh, no, let's continue. Sorry, Angelica. That's okay. Um, Moen asked me kind of like, how do we publish our projects? How do we increase awareness and drive traffic to public input? Uh, this is a super busy slide, but I just like to give all the examples. Um, I always call it my Trojan horse example, but those internal and external articles we publish are often uh, a Trojan horse to launch a new page. So when we hired our new bond manager for our open space bond, that article about Jill ended up being a Trojan horse to get people to the new project site. Um, we use a Facebook platform. Every time we have a um, committee meeting or a board meeting, we launch that again on as a Facebook post with a link. We use our banner on our county site. If we have a really big survey going out, we'll make that part of our rotator. Palm cards I've already talked about, posters at community events, um, those articles and press releases. Uh, press releases are worth their weight. And then we also do recap videos occasionally for some of our bigger projects. And uh, we do those recap videos uh, bilingually as well. So we try to make sure um, that we're using a lot of different outlets. WRES, our tapped in, award-winning tapped in podcast, also highlights a lot of our um, early stage projects. So we might have um, a representative from our planning department come on WRES and talk about affordable housing and then say, hey, there's an affordable housing public survey out and there's a community event coming up. Here's the landing page you can get to to learn more about that. Um, so we try to use all the avenues we have uh, to get out our public survey information. And we occasionally do use paid advertising, especially for our larger projects like the comprehensive plan, where it's really important to us to reach a larger swaths of our community and make sure that those results really were representative. My favorite is the email campaigns. I love having subscribers, like I've told you, and I love giving them updates. Um, and I'm about to send out one today to our election services. Uh, department or our election services subscribers because we just approved a new express vote voting machine and I want them to be the first to know. So I'm going to send that out. Um, and I always like to say MailChimp says that the average open rate for government newsletters is about 29% and ours are so much higher using public input. Again, I think the buy-in there is that people are subscribing to the topics they are most interested in, they are stakeholders for, and we have some really impressive open rates using those email campaigns from public input and just directly driving traffic back to our messages. And I like that we can see our traffic streams. This is pretty important for us just internally as a communications department to justify our budget, to justify our quarterly um, like data that, hey, that one press release we put out about the Greenway got us 117 um, participants from the local news that published that press release, word for word. So we were able to um, capitalize and kind of justify the time it took to do those things and that our proactive communication strategy is working. And we can see which um, platforms are working for us best and maybe which ones we won't. Uh, invest in.